Okay, and you see the, oh, I guess I could, I don't know if you want this data on there, but I'll go put it on there. And you see the red record? Yes, sir. You should look for it before you start, and I think that's it. We're ready to go. All right. All right. Um, good morning. Um, today is uh, December the 13th, 2010. This is an oral history interview with Mr. Mike Flynn. Uh, Mike Flynn is the director of Occupational Safety and Health and Apprenticeship Training for the International Association of Machinists. Uh, Mr. Flynn works out of the IAM headquarters in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Uh, today's interview is part of the Voices of Labor Oral History Project that is directed by the Southern Labor Archives at the Special Collections Department at Georgia State University. It is part of the Georgia State University Library. Uh, the interview is being conducted by Philip Laporte, Director of the Labor Studies Program in the College of Law at Georgia State University. Financial support for the Voices of Labor Oral History Project come from the Joseph Jacobs Fund and the Georgia State AFL-CIO Labor Awards Committee. Uh, Mike, good morning to you. It's, good morning. it's a pleasure to have you here at Georgia State University. I want to begin by uh, asking uh, where you were born. What was your birthplace? My birthplace was it was in Northern Virginia, just outside of um, Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. And I lived there for about 19 years um, prior to moving to Miami, Florida. And uh, what about your your parents, Mike? What did they do, your your mom and dad? Well, my um, my mom um, immigrated into this country from Ireland when she was two years old. Uh, my father is a second generation Irish. Um, my father was a, um, a supervisor for American Airlines at Washington National Airport. And my mom uh, stayed at home and raised um, my nine brothers and sisters. Very, all right, very good. Uh, so, uh, as in terms of schooling, uh, growing up in Northern Virginia, did you attend public schools there? I attended uh, parochial schools up until the um, eighth grade and then went into the public school uh, in, in high school. And was it the, the Jesuits, the Sisters of Mercy, the Benedictines? No, uh, it was the Sisters of St. Joseph mm -hmm. from Cherry Hill, North Carolina, or North uh, New, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, so you completed high school, and then uh, what was your first job in your working career? Well, I worked all through high school. Mm -hmm. um, it was um, it, it was at a time when um, when when you turned 15, you worked. If you wanted a pair of Levi's or if you wanted, you know, a pair of Converse sneakers, and in our family, you worked. Um, the, the money money was tight. Um, we didn't really want for anything. We uh, but we had everything we needed. But anything extra, we worked. And um, so I had a numerous amount of jobs through my high school in the summer and after school, uh, whether it was construction, working in the mall, lowing, mowing uh, lawns, delivering newspapers, the whole gambit as uh, one can do when they're, they're in, uh, in a teenage years. Mm -hmm. okay. And then uh, after those jobs, after you graduated from high school, uh, what did you do then? Was there a career pursuit, uh, technical training? Well, initially, I um, I recall, um, and now this was in 1972, and um, I had determined. Well, I think I wanted uh, the it, the the end of the draft was coming about, um, but I still had um, an interest in in aircraft, and then so I decided. Well, I would go um, sign up voluntarily for the for the U.S. Air Force. Now, um, I met w with a recruiter and they sent me, and this was while I was still in school and they had a program where you could do all the preliminaries and then once you graduated, you would go right into your service. Um, and I went to Baltimore and did the testing. And one thing it did show it, uh, was I was a little borderline high blood pressure. So they said, well, you have to stay over the night and um, we'll retest you. It's not an uncommon thing, out of nervousness and that, and everything fine. We'll swear you in, and then you would report in July. 
Um, well, by the end of the night, I was I was convinced myself. Well, I don't think I want to go this route <laughs> for whatever reason. That I went back home, um, and a few months later, I, I got a job with Eastern Airlines, and I just went right into. I uh, started working at Washington National Airport uh, for Eastern Airlines, uh, working as a um, a helper um, on the ground crews. And that was in 1972. That was in October of 1972. Uh, I was 18 years old. And what were your duties there as a helper with the ground crew? Well, the duties was pretty much to keep the um, foreign objects, debris off the ground around the gates, because the uh, airline, you know, the engines have a tendency to suck up, um, you know, anything that's not tie down and it could create large engine problems in that. So they had a crew that would take care of that. Um, just kind of general utility duties around around the air, airline, airplanes and the ramp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, was that position uh, as a ground crew helper, was that a bargaining unit job? That was and it was a very, uh, my very first experience with a union job. And um, I was totally unaware of uh, union. My, my father, um, as his job within American Airlines was not a union job. I, I, I heard discussions. I know my, one of my uncles was a team, Teamsters with Hostess. And I used to hear him talk about his good uh, pensions and that he got from that. Um, my father, I r recall some conversations when uh, one of the unions, it might have been TWU, where they were trying to organize his group. Um, and But beyond that, I had really very little interaction or understanding of what the union was about. Now, um, very early, um, I, I, it, would, it would be within a month that I hired that the flight attendants at the time were threatening to strike. And I remember sitting in the break room and, and talking to a couple guys, the old timers, about, well, what, what's this thing about the strike? They said, well, when they strike, we, we walk out. What do you mean we walk out? We walk out and support them. So, well, do they pay us? And they, no, they don't pay you. Well, why would I want to do that then? And um, they said, well, son, You'll want to do that because one day you may want them to walk out for you. Well, they came to an agreement at the 11th hour, so we never needed to walk out, but I, I, I got somewhat my first taste of, well, that was what you know, collective unionism was about. You know, they were sticking with, up with one another. Um, and even shortly after that, there was a few times I was late to work and uh, um, my boss would want to talk to me, and he would tell me, well, before you can come in, you need to bring a union steward with you. So that was my first introduction to the union steward, you know, that, and, you know, he was more like a Dutch uncle, just kind of, hey, here's, here's, here's the basic rules you need to follow. I'll help you along the way. He said, we're here to protect your rights, but, you, you know, you, one thing they need you to do, be here on time. If you're not going to be here, there's a process to call in and that. So you know, I started getting the somewhat the understanding of of, of a union as you know, being a, a good big brother to me. I was young and uh, greenhorn in, in the shop at the time. And so that right of representation uh, was in the in the contract, and you had direct experience with a union steward serving as an advisor that assisted you in understanding both your, your rights under the contract and your responsibilities to your employer. Is that a fair That's assessment? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And uh, how long did you stay uh, as a grounds crew helper at Washington National Airport? Well, this is a uh this was a uh, somewhat of a fluke how this happened, but I was um, it was in February of, 2000, of, of 1973. Now, whenever a new job opened uh, throughout the system, and it had to be posted. So there was a posting for six 
um, lead, um, I think the title was um, lead laborers, which was my classification. Now what, and this was a, this was the six openings in Miami. They they built a new hangar for the L ten eleven, and these were rotating shifts. So. So again, I went back to the union. I said, well, what's this about? And they said, well, you get, don't worry about it. You don't have enough seniority. I said, well, what's it about? So he said, well, he said, when um, they, they built this new building, you know, they determined they're going to need, or the shop laborers, that was the name of the classification. They're going to need six lead shop laborers to run the crews there. So um, he said, but, you know, guys with 25, 30 years seniority, they're the ones that are going to get it. I said, well, it can't hurt. I'm a, I can put it in for it. They said, oh, you can put it in for it. So I put it in for it. Well, I received the award. And I received it based because it was a rotating shift. And the old timers, they didn't want the rotating shifts. You know, they were in part of their life where they wanted Saturdays and Sundays off. And, and, and the younger guys in between, they didn't think they had a chance for it. So here I am still, I hadn't yet turned 18, 8, 19. And I get my paperwork to transfer to Miami to run a crew of six guys that, that swept up the hangar, that took care of the hangar when the planes came in and went out and that. So, you know, I was, I pulled everything I owned in a Pinto and drove down to Miami. And I started my career as a, as a uh, shop laborer. Um, one of my, my first supervisor there, um, I don't know how much of the specific personal detail you want to get into this, but uh, my, my, first, my, my first supervisor there who I had to report to, his name was Wolfgang Gettig. Now Wolfgang, came to Eastern after World War II. Eastern had a contract shipping goods and services back between the states and Germany in the rebuilding of, of, of Germany. Um, and Wolfgang was a, during the war, he was, he was too young to be in service, but he was, a, he was in the Nazi uh, youth corps. And he was, um, you know, a hundred percent groomed Nazi. <laughs> I mean, he, 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 he was very self-disciplined, you know, rigid, went by the book, you know, uh, and, um, and the clash between the civilizations as I looked at it here, I mean, there wasn't a hair out of place at him, I come walking in with hair down on my shoulders, you know, as a lead that responsible for this team of guys and, and it just it just didn't fit with him very well. <laughs> so we had our clashes over the years, but I learned <clears throat> and um, that, you know, as as long as I understood our contract book and our rights under the contract and stay within the parameters that that contract gave me, then I'll be okay. So when I went down to Miami, there were 10,000 machinists um, that were working in Miami at that time for Eastern Airlines in you know, all different classifications, from mechanics to stock clerks to the baggage to the cleaners to the shop laborers. Um, and it was a very, very strong union, local. Um, and in and uh, um, probably in 74, um, they also had a very good um, training school across the street, George T. Baker uh, training, uh, aircraft maintenance training, and I, and I registered for that. So I was started getting on a, on a career track of, of becoming a, a mechanic. Uh, so I would go there at nights you know, while I was working during the day. Um, so at this point, Mike, you were 20 years old. You had um, 18 months, two years service with the Eastern Airlines, and then you discovered this opportunity 
across the street, this uh, training center, uh, George C. Baker, uh, that had a uh, course in aircraft maintenance. maintenance. Uh -huh. And so you were working full time and? And going to school. Mm -hmm. um, and with the goal of, of getting my um, A and P tickets, you know, for to be able to be a, a journeyman aircraft mechanic. Now, um, as I was going through there, um, we had um, under our contract, no matter what type of work you did under, they had no, a number. They had a number of a wide, broad range of mechanics under our contract. Um, you could be an avionics mechanic, you could be an engine mechanic, you could be a power plant, sheet metal, um, and each of the disciplines um, a, a, an additional rate of pay would be. Maybe you would get a, you know, maybe 25 cents per license, um, or for an avionics ticket you would get 50 cents. Um, so, as, but once you got into the mechanics classification, then you can move around based on what type of other experience that you have. So, my intent was to get into the classification as soon as I could. And um, in 1975, one of the first um, classes that they send you through, um, George T. Baker, is, is, is metallurgy and um, and painting that. So I got my my certification to to paint aircraft, and I was um, then upgraded to a mechanic in our block overhaul um, uh, area, where I worked for about I guess about a year a year and a half. Now all through this time, um, I became more and more active within the union. I started um, uh, writing for shop stewards, you know, and then offering, um, volunteering, you know, for different projects that they may be doing at, out of the local lodge, fundraisers and stuff. We had a big local lodge across the street, uh, local lodge 702. Um, and there was just a lot of different benefits that they would afford to members there. We had our own Dennis, that, that the dues offset the, some of the prepayment that our regular insurance covered and stuff. They had a, an arrangement with a, an eye doctor over there so you can get eyeglasses for pretty virtually free between the insurance that he negotiated with the company and the a benefit through the union. So there was just a lot of activity going on within, within the local. Um, <clears throat> so I, I started um, getting more and more active and um, and then probably within a um, a year and a half of, of starting with paint then I I, um, I transferred to a upstairs shop job and it was another it was another somewhat of a fluke that a lot of the guys that were in my class at the schools at the school um, a couple of their fathers were in management in some of these shops. They had gone through the ranks and then became foreman and that. But they knew what shops were going to be opening up and when they were going to be hiring people. And there was an, an interior shop that they said there's going to be 12 openings coming, you know, and that's uh, working on the interior cabinets and seats and um, windows and that of, of aircraft that come in for overhaul. Um, so we all put in our paperwork for it, and this was a day, this was a day shift job, Saturdays and Sundays off, which if you only have five years, <clears throat> you don't expect to see that in that industry for 15 years. So um, since we had kind of the inside scoop on it, we all ended up up at this shop. So, um, you know, we got some, those good hours, but it also gave us opportunity to, um, especially me, gave me the opportunity to get more and more involved with, with the union um, and what, what was going on there uh, since my I was on the normal shifts 
Right. Right. And so union meetings um, held in, in the evenings or other events sponsored by the union scheduled in the evenings or political activities scheduled right. in the evening. So by a, a five-year seniority uh, employee who successfully bids on a day shift job then gave you the opportunity to participate more in those union events and activities? Yes. Mm -hmm. And and then it and my I think my my passion for the union, you know, started growing at that point. I started seeing that, um, especially just being the, the shop steward on the floor, um, where you know, people would seek me out for advice and guidance on whether things were grievances and, or not, or to pursue it. And, um, and and I'm starting to understand how, you know, how to make those kind of decisions. Whether I mean, we would have uh, when, when I, for an example, went up to this shop where most of the most of the guys that were working were, you know, cl a lot closer to their retirement than they were not. You know, mm -hmm. They might have two, three years left or so. And these are old World War II veterans. They were just fascinating in themselves, the stories that they had. But, you know, they would come to me and they say, uh, one guy came to me, I remember one day, and said, you know, can you do something about the light down at 36th Street? I said, what? He said, well, the Pan Am hangar is on. You know, we're, we're going to be making a right. The Pan Am hangar is right across from the Eastern hangar. And they have their own service room to go into that hangar. Right next to it is the Eastern. Well, I'm sitting over here waiting for they turn on their blinker, but I don't know whether they're going to be turning into the Eastern or the Pan Am room. I said, well, that's not a grievance. <laughs> I can't, there's only so much I could do, but it's not the grievance. You know, so. <laughs> but, you know, I found out, you know, it, it, it gave people an ability to vet. Bent. Mm -hmm. Somewhat, you know, whether it was too cold in the building or that. The union couldn't take care of everything, but at least there was an outlet for them. Right. And he just gave them the respect of listening. Found out when it came time to, for the important issues, mm -hmm. you know, that respect mm -hmm. just built, you know, and then you can see down the road, mm -hmm. you know, you can build good rapport with, with folks that way. Right. You know, they say every experience uh, impacts and influences us in some way. So in listening uh, to you, uh, perhaps your experience with Wolfgang uh, made you aware of the specifics of the contract and what you could do as a union official and you could not do. Do you think that played a role in your service as a job steward? I think, it, I, without a doubt, without a doubt, because he was, he was so rigid in that, but he knew where his boundaries were, you know. And, in fact, at one time, about a year and a half later, I had to go out. I, I needed to go out. I needed. I needed two weeks off. There was just no. There was just too much going on in Colorado where I was going to be there. And and I always had burned all my days off, you know, on vacations early. <coughs> and went to Wolfgang, knowing he was going to say no, right? But he he had to for the protocol. I had to go through. So, you know. But I knew. I also knew the manager. And the manager was um, um, a good Catholic, so um, I use that to my advantage. Like, there, there's a retreat going on in in Colorado, you know, these two weeks there, you know, and I'm considering, you know, attending that. He said, oh, well, "By all means." I said, "Well, I don't have the vacation. Well, just let Wolfgang know I approved it." So, <laughs> So, you had a manager who was uh, filled with grace and was looking out for your soul. My soul. He was, and I think probably in the background he was hoping my soul would stay out. <laughs> and uh, you had mentioned that there were 10,000 machinists in, in Miami. Uh, now, were they all members of Local Lodge 702? Yes. Or were, they were? Yes. So, there was that concentration. Of, of union members, 10,000 in that one local lodge in Miami. Yes. And so the standing and status that that local lodge must have had in that community in terms of uh, purchasing power, in terms of political clout, 
in terms of uh, their standing in the community. Can you comment a little bit about that and the size of that local lodge? It, it, it was it was it was huge. No matter um, you know any politician that was you know wanting to you know put their name in any hat you know came through those doors you know and then they they had a um, and we had a lot of smart members that that were active within um, the local political scenes. We had a number of our members that that ran you know for for the different councilmen and mayors. Now we have a, one of our ex presidents of our, our lodge. He was the president of Lodge 702 when I was the president of 1690. He's now the mayor of, um, of um, a town down in Florida. It's not Plantation. I'll think of the name. It's right next to uh, Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but he was a councilman there, you know, for years. And um, and you know, no matter what what they did, the amount of money that that that, that represented as far as just the buying power mm -hmm. uh, of the community, it was it was it was it, you know. For you know, and you uh, mentioned that you became a steward in that local lodge. Uh, what stewards? Uh, well, what year was that? And you were a steward with the mechanics when you were in the painting craft. I was a steward in the painting, and then when I went up into the interior department, um, and in '79, um, they opened up a, they expanded our sea check operation um, to Atlanta. So they moved a big group of mechanics up to Atlanta. Uh, or I guess that they opened that up in 88. Well, um, I had put in my paperwork to transfer on that. It took about a year for me to get to have the seniority to be able to transfer. Um, and that's, um, and I guess that was in January of um, 79. That I ended up in Atlanta. Now, Atlanta, we had 800 mechanics. We had, had, a, had a total of 3,200 machinists. But out of that number, there was only 800 that were mechanics. We had the line mechanics, and then we had the hangar mechanics that we did the, um, what they call the sea checks, overnight checks of aircraft. Um, they would roll in at midnight and um, and usually that airplane rolled out by by the end of the first shift uh, the next day. Mm -hmm. And the uh, machinists worked at the uh, eastern property here in Atlanta. Uh, and what type of equipment were they working on? Aircraft? Yes. Um, pretty much you worked on the, um, the DC-9s. The 727s, um, we would have, um, for the day we, um, the L-1011s. Now, some of the planes wouldn't fit all the way into the hangar, but um, um, the, pretty much their whole fleet, the seven. The the 1011s, the L1011s, and the seven uh, A300s were primarily worked in Miami, uh, but if they needed aircraft on the ground repair, we could do it here. Uh, but it was mainly the 727s and DC9s that were doing the sea checks operations. So when you say sea check, it's C is in Charlie. Charlie check, yeah. Yeah. And what was the um, the work that was performed, uh, could mechanics go across the, the different aircraft? If you had a mechanic who was assigned to do interior work, uh, would they be able to perform those duties on both the DC-9s and the 727s? Yes. Yep. Yeah, they, yeah, they were um, trained for all aircraft. Now, you could bid into your specific crews. 
So you would know that more than likely you, you would bid, let's say you, you would bid avionics, you, you would bid um, uh, sea check 727 crew. So you would, 99% of your time you would be there, but you could be farmed out to do other work. That would be able. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. And so it was uh, Atlanta in 1979. 800 mechanics and the local lodge had 3,200 employees? 3,200 members. 3,200 members. And how did you find the, the difference in comparing your experience down in Miami with what you found uh, in Atlanta? Well, um, I, I probably, I used the word, I started getting the passion for the union mm -hmm. down there, but it exploded up here. And um, it exploded because I saw um, so many opportunities that this, the union, local union had here that they weren't taking advantage of um, and providing the types of services that I know were, the union was capable of doing because I came from a local that was progressive, you know, that, that did things that were engaged politically that was um, uh, involved in a lot more community services types of activities and that. And I learned, one of my greatest lessons I learned, and I think it was um, uh, probably one of the first couple of meetings that I came, came to up in, in Atlanta, and um, they were discussing some, some issue, I'm not sure what it was, and um, and I raised my hand to uh, and comment on it. And I uh, stood up and I, I said, well, and I started my sentence like this. I said, uh, Mr. President, in Miami, they, he takes a hand, gavels, hold it, hold it, brother. <coughs> and he, uh, he goes, I want everybody to look out the window. Does anybody see a palm tree? <laughs> Get a big hoop, you know. Okay. Well, we're not in Miami. Now, what were you saying, brother? <laughs> Never mind, brother. <laughs> so that was my lesson, okay? And they're, they're not, it stuck to me. And, and I started realizing that um, it was somewhat of a good old boy cliquish operation happening here. Um, they were, um, there wasn't a lot of people that were at the union meetings. There was not a lot of interest of getting people to the union meetings. Uh, the bylaws were the bylaws and what they could write into the bylaws and have passed into the bylaws gave them the opportunity to do what they wanted to do. They wanted to send 12 people to Jekyll Island for a, for a legislative weekend, they would send 12 people to a legislative weekend. Um, and the 12 would be the same 12 that, that went to the next one to, to whatever there's going, you know. So it was a, it was a, um, it could be taken, it wasn't anything illegal, but I don't, the, the intent of uh, union funds, I believe, was for the betterment of the, of the whole. Um, and over the years, um, prior to them opening up the maintenance station, um, the ramp was pretty much major. They, they ran the local, you know, and maintenance had very little influence into what was going on there. You know, they, the only mechanics that were there were pretty much the line mechanics. You know, now they brought in you know, another 600 people, most of them from Miami, you know, from around the system, that that knew, you know, what what a local can provide, you know, what services can be provided and supported. Um, and so uh, at that point. Um, you know, I started saying, well, I need to get active, and you know, I, I 
became a steward up here and volunteered to be a, a, a trustee, got, became a trustee, and, uh, got on the audit committee. Um, a lot of, the, you know, the grunt work that was there, but showed that, you know, I would be willing to pull up my sleeves and get the work. And, uh, and started gaining, you know, respect of different people. So I, um, um, so things were starting to change some. We, we, we had divided, um, put together two different, there was clearly two different, the red slate and the green slate of, our political parties of when we ran for elections, we were going to support, um, and we were in '83. We came very close to going on strike, um, and they had a, a literally, I think they came to an agreement at five minutes before midnight on the day we were walked. We had all of our toolboxes walked out. They we took them all home, and um, we had. Our strike headquarters set up at Holiday Inn, um, up on the hill, and everybody had their strike assignments, you know, for picketing and that. And um, and we ended up not going out, um, but it was a good run up for what was to come down the road, you know, in a few years down the road. Um, it's just a couple of questions about uh, your role uh, in Atlanta as a steward. Now, was that an elected position? Yeah, yes. And were you elected from among the mechanics as that one unit electing a steward from uh, there? Um, yeah, you were elected by, from your own um, shift mm -hmm. and classification. And did you bring your own constituency with you from Miami with that transfer of 600 people? Um, there, there was a few of them, <laughs> but um, um, and there, there was a few that I knew from Miami, but um, by and large, most of them um, we had just met over the last year or so. <laughs> and what do you attribute um, your gaining support from with a new group of workers in a new location, in a new local, um, that they want Mike Flynn to be their steward. They want Mike Flynn to be their representative. Uh, well, I lined up with the with the ones that did have that experience with with the chief steward. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I I worked closely with him, you know, and and he threw his support, you know, behind me and um, threw his support to send me to like leadership schools. That's where the union would have schools. Um, off site, we at that now. Well, now we have our own um, standalone training center. Uh, but at that time, we would be sent to different labor centers around the country. Went to University of Alabama, uh, labor studies, um, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado for second year leadership school. But um, you know, once I started getting recognized by that that group, and that's where we talked about like the green slate and that of the, the different people that um, they they showed that, you know, they they supported and respected me, then they would encourage their friends to vote for me. Mm -hmm. And the trustee position and audit committee, were those appointed positions? The trustee I ran, it was a, um, it was a, a two-year appointment. Uh, or elected, um, and the election took place when the local lodge elect uh, elections took place, um, and the audit was chosen at a uh, elected at a union meeting. Uh, there's um, twice a year in our constitution the local has to have a, an audit, and that's how they would go about doing it. So you were elected to. Uh, be a job steward uh, from your shift in classification. Uh, you were elected as a two-year term to be a trustee for the local union. Then you were elected at a union meeting to be on the uh, audit committee. And so you won elections in three different forums for three different positions uh, for the local lodge in Atlanta. Right. And so you had a, a record uh, both of service to the local lodge and uh, 
of training that you completed through leadership school that you were sent to by the IAM. Right. And so we are now uh, in 1983, and you were, were looked at as a leader of the local <coughs> lodge. And as preparations went forward uh, for a possible strike in 1983, uh, what role were you assigned in preparing for that strike, Mike? Um, well, I was one of the, sh the strike captains, mm -hmm. um, and which I was responsible for the second shift um, hangar group, uh, which would be assigning in order for our members to be eligible to collect their strike benefit. Um, uh, they have to um, participate in, in strike duties, you know, whether it's at the local making hot dogs or um, running transportation to and from the strike picket lines, um, you know, picketing itself. So it would be setting up the um, schedules for for the, the group. The second shift would probably would probably have been. Um, probably close to 300 people that would be um, have to be assigned. I would be responsible to make sure each of those had their assignments and then carry them out and check them off in order for them to be able to get their their strike benefit. And then just deal with anything that, you know, would come up in between there for that, that group. Mm -hmm. And the logistics uh, for that, did it, it include a great deal of, of planning, a great deal of uh, networking, telephone trees, all of those things to coordinate that number of people for such an activity as? Well, a lot of that, the initial, uh, I don't think we, we looked far beyond that first day, in the first <laughs> week, but it was like before they walked out on that Friday, they knew where they were expected to be on their next if the strike goes down, who was going to be the first ones, you know, at each strike picket's location and what they'd be doing. Um, and one, one of my finest uh, duties was to, there was, there was two guys on my shift that we got the word that they went into work, they were going to scab. So they would go into work at 8 o'clock. We're sitting over at the Holiday Inn preparing, you know, getting everything. So we get a call that these guys have shown up to show up to work. So I put them first on it. They were going to be the first on strike duty at the gate. So I had to call them up and say, you know, I got your, got your strike duty ready for you. So they had to tell me personally, you know, well, I'm, I'm not going to be, well, what do you mean? Well, I'm a supervisor now. I said, well, by our, by our constitution, there, there's no such thing as becoming a supervisor four hours before the strike. <laughs> I said, go walk in and you're a scab. That's what you're going to be. I'm going to make sure you under, understand that. Well, we all have to make our decisions. I said, well, yes, you did. So they ended up, um, going into work and we ended up rolling our toolboxes back in. Eastern laid them off that Monday mm. and they never came back to work. Wow. So it was like they were told, you know, you, you all had to, you know, you, we're back, you know, we're back and uh, we're ready to go to work but mm -hmm. it's not going to be a good environment if we have to work around two scabs. So Eastern Airlines didn't get the notice that these two employees had been promoted to supervisors four hours before the... Well, they got the notice, but they, as a supervisor, they didn't have any um, bumping rights, right? Sure, sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it was quite a conversion that happened very quickly. Yeah. But it was miraculous. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Interesting. Um, now, you mentioned the red slate and the green slate. Uh, could you explain to us uh, what uh, comprised the red slate and the green slate in terms of that election? Well, um, 
I think the green slate probably had um, more of a gen, uh, more of a influence from the Miami um, group. Um, our most of our um, business representatives were the general chairman. We were calling. Uh, we would have. Uh, somewhere around 12 uh, general chairmen. Now they were all elected at large. <clears throat> so because of the sheer size of Atlanta, of Miami, um, seven or eight of them would come out of Miami. Um, if anybody was going to come out of Atlanta to be part of that green slate, um, they would have to be able to to bring something to the table, you know, the number of votes that are needed. So, mm -hmm. so um, the majority of the Atlanta slate was influenced by was was red that were trying to get more seats, and they really had the political capital to get. Um, let me see how I explain this. Uh, um, Charlie Bryan, you heard of Charlie Bryan? Yes, right? sir. Okay. Now, Charlie, he was the green. He was green slate. Um, the guy that he beat was a guy by the name, of, and Green also was influenced much by uh, me the mechanic classification, which mechanics they were the majority classification out of Miami. Overall, actually, but um, maybe by the time you get through all the stations, it was close to 50 50, but their core group was in Miami. Um, he had won an election by a guy by the name of Jimmy Cates, who was a ramp, um, and who was strongly supported by many of the folks in Atlanta and the ramp, heavy ramp in Miami. So when Charlie took over the district. Um, pretty much all but two of the general chairmen ended up being from the green slate. You know, they were endorsed. They endorsed each other. They, you know, they campaigned for each other, and um, um, now we had one. One guy here, um, a fellow by the name of Art Schaefer, and he was a general chairman. He was on a red slate, but he had he had gotten elected. But the last election after this last strike, he got unelected. So it was like one of the first times an incumbent got beat, even though he had been an incumbent. Mm -hmm. But I think the Green it probably more influenced by the uh, by mechanic classification than anything. Um, and we just tended to lean that way just because I, I lent that way just because I saw that uh, I felt they were much more progressive, you know, and could deliver a lot of services to everybody. As evidenced by the services offered in Miami. Right. With the visual, the dental, the, you know, couldn't get that traffic light changed for that yeah. uh, ramp-way into the hangar, but uh, also the political consideration where elected officials would come. And so the red slate, was that uh, defined primarily by um, personnel that were not from Miami and were not mechanics? Is that, is that the distinction or is there another distinction that would make someone uh, part of the red slate? Um. Most of them were not mechanics. There was a mm -hmm. couple mechanics, but most of them were not mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, so were they uh, ramp workers? Were yeah, they, they, most of them were, were ramp or stores. You know, um, handled sure. this. Right. So they would be in, in parts depot and, and providing parts the mechanics would right. use. Yeah. Yeah. Shipping and receiving. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
in some industries that are called uh, material handlers. Right. All right, so the, um, the green slate comes to uh, dominate, and I, I think you said uh, 8 out of 12 general chairmen from the green slate, is that correct? Were me mechanics. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Mike Flynn is now uh, preparing, and um, your your efforts uh, to prepare uh, the local for this uh, strike uh, should it come in negotiations. And that was 1983. Is that correct? 83, yeah. May 3rd. And uh, and how old were you now at this time? Well, at 80. I was 29. I guess I was um, 84. I would be. Yeah, I was like 29. Yeah. And uh, how was the, the work that you did in preparation for that, how was that received among uh, the hierarchy in the IAM? Uh, were you recognized for your efforts, your work, for that passion you showed for that union work? Yeah, I, I think we, I, I think it was being, I think it was acknowledged and um, I started being invited to, in, invited to more uh, functions internal, even you know internal green functions. They would have like a green side. It would, it would be called a green side. They would have a green side picnic, or they would have a green side um, leading up to um, a next year's election on on selecting a slate, you know, to take positions. And um, those meetings would be held down in Miami. So you know, if you were invited to go down to there, then you know you're you know, they're, they're seeking your input from here and, and, and that on, um, you know, what names are we going to forward, push forward from up here to get on the slates down there. And, um, you know, it's, uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of informal, but, um, you know, it was an important process to be able to keep our group together moving mm -hmm. forward. So, mm -hmm. you know. All right. Um, one of the things I, I just want to ask about is the, the IAM structure and how uh, mechanics were uh, viewed as being the most skilled, the most training, uh, adding the most value in terms of uh, getting aircraft out and, and ready to fly, and yet the machinists uh, also represented many other employees, many other crafts uh, that were employed by the airline. Uh, ramp agent cleaners, uh, the ground crew that you began with, uh, and how the IAM uh, dealt with representing uh, uh, employees that were members of the same union but were from a wide variety of different crafts. Well, that's interesting, and that's that's, that's a whole could take a whole day on that, but. It, it was one of the biggest challenges that I had. Now I was, there was a, a group called AMFA. Now they came to Eastern when I was still in Miami trying to um, wedge, put that wedge between the mechanics and, um, and the, uh, other classifications. Well the mechanics stood up and locally and fought them off and you know we don't we don't have you know we don't don't come here waste giving us that banter we're, we're together here um, now they started showing up in, in Atlanta also when I came up there now I use that when I began and looking I was going to be running for president um, in 84, um, I use that as a positive, that I'm, I'm here, I'm a mechanic, yet I also served in other classifications. And if anybody, and, and, and it was the, the hardest to sell was, was, the, was, was the mechanics. So if anybody thinks they're going to come along and convince you because of your high skill, and or convince you because these folks don't have as high skill as you that they're draw keeping you down from making two and three times more an hour. It's a lie. It's nothing but a lie because 
the, the strength that we have at that bargaining table is the strength in the numbers as a whole. Um, and where we succeeded and where we were, no matter where that took place, what station, where they succeeded in keeping unity at the local level, um, AMFA didn't get any headway. They didn't make any headway into that group, and they went on. Um, now I've seen it, you know, subsequently. Um, the same thing happened at Northwest. It happened at United, and they bit, and they bit into that apple. And it wasn't. It didn't take long, you know, for them not only to have lost their jobs, lost the work work farmed out and without having that large group of numbers to support they didn't have any leverage um, but but being able to talk from from both sides and seeing that I think it was beneficial to me and it was um, it, it also gave uh, my brothers and sisters in the other classifications somewhat of comfort you know that here I am a mechanic, but but you know, but arguing, you know, to keep everybody together, you know, and, and not dismissing them just because they're a different classification. Mm -hmm. And that was for me, it, it was the toughest challenge because the the numbers in Atlanta um, was two to one, you know, it was two to one non-skilled to skilled mechanics, so they could. Um, you know, normally they never had. They very rarely did they ever have a a president that was that came out of the mechanical classifications. Mm -hmm. And so your your role as being able to speak to the interests of both uh, the skilled mechanics and uh, the employees that held other classifications that you had that credibility because you had done it. Right. <clears throat> right. And and it was. And, and where I saw that in areas and knowing in areas around the system where um, where they um, succeeded is where they didn't put up that local fight. You know that they depended on other people from the outside. You know, help. Amphas coming in and they're you know getting people to think like that. And, you know, it, it really has to be taken on. All mm -hmm. fights, everything's. Political is local, right? And all fights like that are local too. You know, yeah. And uh, you have to have the people that have the credibility at the local level to be the one, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. taking the forefront on that. Uh, 1983, the uh, contract uh, was settled. Uh, and how long was that agreement for? Was it a three year deal, a four year deal? It was a um, Trying to think that normally it was it would be a three year contract. Mm -hmm. um, now that that contract was um, it was very unique in that in in it because um, much of our. There was different formulas that were put in place there on the amount of. Um, I'm trying to think of that. I, I may get the, I may get this timeline wrong here. Lorenzo took over in '86, so that was it. Yeah. Part of our agreement in that contract was we would our raises was contingent upon. The amount of work that we could identify, savings that we could identify by bringing work in. Um, they set up joint labor management committees that would go out and they look at just different things we're buying, products they're buying. Is there ways that we can fabricate those products cheaper in house? You know, they were buying like VW ashtrays for the lavatory doors at four hundred and something dollars a pop. You know, so, so these these committees now Charlie Bryant and is um, 
you know, coming from a strategic standpoint and negotiating that, he had already had put together his own committee <coughs> up front and had identified tens of millions of dollars of savings <coughs> that if the company was interested in um, of using those savings in order to justify in wage increases, we're ready to go, you know. Um, so they signed that, and, and once they started unveiling how much money this is representing, they had to come back and, and back out of that agreement because they said, number one, it wouldn't be fair. The pilots and the flight attendants, they would have like a Me Too clause in, in their contracts. But, you know, what kind of savings <coughs> can a pilot identify? You know, can, what kind of savings can a flight attendant identify compared to the type of savings you all are identifying? You know, anything that's being produced for service or anything on the plane, you can figure out cost savings there. You know, the numbers are going up. A pilot, what do you get? Well, like a taxi with one engine, you know, for 45 seconds or <laughs> It just wasn't there, so they had to restructure that contract to have the fixed um, wage increases put in there. And that, at that point, that's when um, <coughs> it was shortly after that is when uh, the sale of the airline, you know, took place. Because we felt after that '83, we were on top. We felt really good because we, you know, we we got some major concessions without going on strike. We felt that we were confident that the formulas were going to give us some decent uh, wage increases along the way and everything's intact. Um, and then, you know, within two years it was sold to Frank Lorenzo. So those um, joint labor management efforts, uh, they were uh, part of the agreements that Eastern and the IAM entered into. And can you give us some examples of some of the um, efforts uh, examining uh, machinery, examining uh, engines, examining the uh, maintenance protocols, uh, perhaps greater fuel efficiency? What were some of the things that those committees came up with for those cost savings? Um. Fabricating um, or um, overhauling parts that would be retooling parts that were thrown away, and where they would have to fabricate brand new parts, find other ways to to fix items that were destined for the trash. Um, Using different lighter materials, other materials, and what they to reduce their weight inside the aircraft, you know, for the, uh, for the seats and that. Um, I think uh, a big push was on identifying other vendors that can provide the same products for cheaper, which was a huge amount. Like there was some uh, a lot of sweetheart deals. That, that was uncovered, that was, um, you know, that people should have ended up going to jail on, um, on the type of purchasing that they were doing in mass. So, um, a good friend of mine was, um, in fact, he was matched up. He was our, he was a, um, I think he was a system board of adjuster. He, under the Railway Labor Act, they have, the union has their rep, the company has their rep, and then there's a neutral system board of adjuster, which is one for the company, one for the union, that is this, they're hearing the case of arbitrations, and then, um, well, him and his counterpart, who was an attorney for Eastern, they did a, a um, they literally did a, 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 a field trip around driving from station to station, uh, identifying products and that that they could have 
that they bought, and then they come back and do the research on where they could purchase this other stuff from. So, um, and they, you know, both parties that seem to have gone into it in good faith, mm -hmm. you know. But um, I think the amount of numbers they never fathom that the numbers would get so high that it could affect the the wages as it did. So, um, I mean, they had to give us a one-time lump of, uh, payment and then go back to our standard, you know, 3 percent increase over each year. <clears throat> so it's 1983. The contract has been settled. Uh, the labor management efforts uh, were being held up uh, as a model for uh, labor management initiatives. Uh, 84 and 85, right in that area, right? And then Mike Flynn decides uh, that he might consider running for president of the local lodge in Atlanta. Is that correct, 1984? 1984, yeah. And the election, how many candidates were in that election? Well, there was two. There was two, and um, I'm trying to think what month we ran in. I think we would run it in November. The election, and uh, I lost. In my first election, I lost, and I lost by um, thirty-five votes. And it, I, would, I would always say, you know, you know, Atlanta, they're so nice down here. You know, people are nice. <laughs> and I would tell people uh, that would come in from other cities afterwards, and, and you come down, and it's a great place to campaign because, you know, they, it's not like being in New York where they call you, you're a bum, you know, get the hell out of here. <laughs> in Atlanta, you had that friendly southern courtesies, you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, to the point I thought, well, I got, I got this thing, you know. So, uh, but I ended up losing by 35, uh, 35 votes. We had a big, um, it's all day vote, so, you know, I mean, it's always a big turnout. It's probably 80, 80 some percent of the membership turns out the vote. And, um, <clears throat> but it was a good, it was a it was a good exercise, and I felt okay afterwards, and uh, you know stayed active, you know, through it, and then um, and then um, really the drums of war started started sounding in in the distance after the um, you know Lorenzo buyout. Um, I'm trying to think. The, the guy that I ran against, um, okay. yeah. the guy that I ran against was not, <clears throat> he had won. I guess he was his, he was on to his second term, and then so he he won. Then I ran against him the second time, and that's when I won. Two years later, I I won, and um, I uh, I credit that win to a um, to identifying a. I wouldn't say it's a loophole, but it's a. In our Constitution, it, say, it says that you can ask for an absentee ballot if you live 25 miles from the vote, you know, the voting polling place, if you're on vacation or if you're on sick leave. Now, you as a person have to be the one to request it. I mean, you request it directly to the recording secretary or notify him in writing by U.S. mail. So um, me and my team, our, our green team, 
came up with a, a postcard that wrote that language verbatim all out of our Constitution. And it says, I so-and-so, and then you could check off whatever box that you come in, and then <clears throat> we can go, we can mail them in. We can't deliver them personally to the local, but since we bought, we bought postcards that were already pre-stamped, which is it was like 15 cents or something, whatever it was, and just throw them into the mailbox. So everybody on the team, you know, we could get the list from the local um, through the you know, DOL regulation, you get an address, current list. Everybody knew, you know, who lives 25 miles away, they would be responsible for that. So, um, so by the time the election came around, it was like 10 times as many absentee requests came in as any other election before. <coughs> and we knew everybody that we, we gave the cards to, so it was up to us to follow up on everybody. You know, we know that, you know, the cards are going to be mailed to you, you know, they're sending out today, you should be getting them in a couple days, so make sure you vote. So it made a difference in the election. You know, so, mm -hmm. so. Well, there's nothing like using the rules uh, to your advantage. Oh, yeah. And it's in the Constitution. It's quoted from the Constitution. And so eligible employees receive uh, that information, and those who are eligible took advantage of it. Is that essentially the story? That was it. The story? That was yeah. it. Yeah, well, and uh, how many votes did you win by, do you recall? Well, that one I won by about 140. And it, the participation rate, you said in the first election, was 80 percent approximately? Yeah, we were getting up to the top. So we were getting close to the 90s on, on that last one. Right. Yeah. Um, and it, it was set up to where uh, uh, we requested to be able to set up a um, voting close to the airport. So their local was all the way over in Forest, Forestville. Set up a hotel right across from the airport there. And that, and that, you have to get a approval from the international to do that, and do notice and all that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, but yeah, looking at the rules and saying, well, how can we make this work for us is uh, one of the most interesting parts of the job, even today. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Some might say in a presidential uh, primary that caucus votes count just as much as uh, primary votes. So uh, delegates are gained by whatever means is set up. Yeah. So we saw the difference that made in that Democratic presidential primary, sure. Uh, knowing the rules and using the rules, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, it, it, as we trace your career and uh, the evolution of Eastern Airlines, uh, uh, the uh, uh, do you recall when uh, Frank Borman uh, became the president and CEO of uh, Eastern Airlines? At what stage in your career? Um. I think he was there when I came there. Mm -hmm. he, I think he started in like 68 or so, if I'm not mistaken. But I remember him, um, I mean, he he had a presence around him, you know, that, um, you know, had that celebrity presence around him just by, you know, virtue of him going up to the moon and that, you know, and uh, he was used as our he was a mouthpiece, and he was a commercials for for Eastern, you know. And, uh, still remember him walking out, you know, with the aircraft, you know, saying we, the largest airline in the free world, flying more people, more places. You know, the wings, the wings of man. And he he was featured uh, at that time, of course. Uh, the uh, CEO is spokesperson. And uh, Frank Borman was uh, on a commercial in front of a number of Eastern employees, including pilots and flight attendants and mechanics and ramp workers, uh, saying at Eastern Airlines, we earn our wings every day. Every day. And in another commercial, he was quoted as saying, uh, 
uh, that pe when people ask me about how the airline business is today, I tell people at Eastern Airlines, things are going zoom. And he held his hand out and made a motion as an airplane rising in the sky. And uh, apparently, uh, Eastern was uh, doing well. The labor management initiatives were paying great dividends. Uh, it was flying more people than any other airline. And then we, we had a change. Uh, and Eastern Airlines began asking employees for concessions, began seeking to take back uh, wage increases and benefits, etc. Do you recall um, the time frame for that, Mike? Well, well this kind of brings us back. This is going to rattle something in my mind back in, um, when I was in Miami. Mm -hmm. And this is probably a crucial point for me personally. But um, I guess it was at 70, 78 or so. No, 76, 1976. Uh, they set up a, they called it the VEP, Variable Earnings Program. And and we would get stock in lieu of wages for increases. So we were going to vote on this thing. And we get this packet in the mail and on a Friday. This thing has a prospectus in it. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it was sent to somebody that, that familiar with stocks and bonds and you have to get the whole annual reports and all that. Well, the perspectives of what this program was all about. And I took it over to the library. Because I could hardly read it, understand it, and I was going down through it. Just, and I called our leader <clears throat> at Monday, our district, and he was a pre predecessor to Charlie Bryant. And I and and he would never return my call. Call the office and never return my call. So somebody told me, Well call this guy, this guy by the name of George Brown, who was one of our international reps retired. And he goes, He don't like him, he'll he maybe he can give you some guidance. So I called him and he goes he goes, I tell you what, he said, I'm gonna give you William Whippensinger's phone number at home. He goes, don't tell him where you got it. But you just tell them what you told me, because it, it doesn't sound right, what you're saying. <clears throat> so I called. Now, I didn't know who William Whippensinger was from Cat in the Hat. I mean, it just, so I called him, and he answers the phone. So yeah, this is Mike Flynn. I work down in Miami, Eastern Airlines. And he goes, oh, I just got in from Ireland or something. So well, I said, here, I said, I've been trying to call. Cause he asked, he goes, did you call, you know, call your, your DVR? I said, I tried to call, nobody answered my phone call. He said, well, what's your question? I said, we're supposed to vote on this thing tomorrow. They renting, they're renting out the Miami Stadium for us to vote on this contract. And it's about some kind of wage concession. And they sent all this prospectus information and stock information. And I don't know shit or Shinola. I said, now, I can guarantee you, I probably spent more time than anybody else. I spent all day Saturday and half day Sunday at the Coral Gables Library trying to figure this out. And I said, I still don't know what it means. I said, now, I don't think it's right that the union does that to me like that. They should explain it so we can understand it. So, well, son, so let, me, let me make a few phone calls and see what's going on there. And the next day it came out, they delayed. He, he got it delayed. He got it to delay it. And they were told to set up informational meetings for the membership, and then the vote will be the following week. <laughs> you know, never would have said Flynn or anything about it, but that was something that, that it just stuck to me. I mean, here's a union that you know, got to talk to the top guy, and you know he, 
he empathized, you know, what was going on there. But um, just a couple of of notes. Uh, William Wimpensinger, of course, was the international president uh, of the International Association of Machinists, uh, uh, and uh, a DBR is a directing business agent. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry, uh, directing business representative. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So you, Mike Flynn from Miami, picks up the phone, calls the international president and got the vote delayed on the ratification of the wage concession for uh, stock uh, until such time as the, the union, the international, would explain exactly what it was going to uh, involve, what the effect would be on wage earners represented by the IAM. Right, and the vote went through and the vote passed. And, and, and at the end of the day, the, the stock that we received was valueless. <laughs> Once they went bankrupt, there was had no value at all. <laughs> but, um, but it, but it, at least everybody that wanted to had an opportunity to, to get more informed about it, which they felt was the best that they could do. You know, whether they want to vote for it or not, that's their option. Now, um, now even after. Uh, the 83 um, vote uh, ratification of that 83 contract, um, there were some efforts of joint labor management um, uh, working together committees. You know, that was somewhat of a trend going on in the U.S. labor management. Um, and eventually that disintegrated because the um, one of the one of the uh, one of the main problems the company did here we had a change of leadership and even some of our stewards and chief stewards were removed from office um, which were they were full-time jobs but you know the people decided they wanted to put other folks in there um, the company still tapped them to be on these other committees, these labor management committees, that, um, um, and because of that, you know, they it just did not succeed. You know, people felt that you know we we unelected them for a reason, and if we're going to be on a joint labor management committee, we'll decide who who's going to be on the labor side of things, and you all can decide who's going to be the management. Um, so so. And that was probably one of the last efforts that they put together prior to Lorenzo uh, coming in and, and taking over the airline. Well, that's interesting in that um, if it's a labor management committee, then as you say, labor is to name the labor representatives. The, the company doesn't name uh, the union's representative. I'm sure. Uh, that the union would have liked to have the opportunity to name the management representatives yeah. to the labor <laughs> management committee, but <laughs> oh my stars! Uh, so we have um, your election, and now you are the president uh, here in Atlanta of Local Lodge 1690. And uh, at, in what role did you play? Uh, as president of Local Lodge 1690 uh, in terms of uh, subsequent uh, negotiations with Eastern Airlines? Um, I was not directly involved with the negotiations. Um, president, uh, the uh, president of the district, Charlie Bryan. Um, I also was on the executive board of the district, that uh, the district under our constitution is responsible for the negotiating and administrating of the contracts. Um, the locals are responsible for just administrating local activities um, in, the area, in those areas. Um, now our, my vice president for the local um, was put on the negotiating committee as a representative from Atlanta. Um, and he was from another classification. They had um, 
Charlie was the head uh, negotiator. He had uh, three other rank and file members on the committee, and he had two subject matter experts on finance and pensions. That was really the core group within the um, negotiations. Now, <clears throat> leading up to to there, um, there um, the charge from Lorenzo was there are no gray areas within our contracts. Everything's black and white. So any past pra practice, if it's not in the book, it doesn't exist. Um, they implemented a, a new uh, attendance program that they had a right to do under the contract. Um, terminations started just, I think by the time uh, we went on strike, it was in the hundreds um, system-wide of people that had been terminated that were the waiting arbitration, you know, and um, most of them would get, um, in fact, most of them received an award after the they went out of business, but they received it on five cents on the dollar because it, the fund was, you know, was included into the bankruptcy funds. Mm -hmm. So you had all this this turmoil going on, so, you know, a, a big role that, um, that I was somewhat involved in was trying to keep the cap on from over overflowing. I mean, we 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 knew the importance. I mean, the the law. If we went outside the law, the company would not blink before they would, you know, uh, come down on you. You know, with, with the strength of the law. You know, so you know, any kind of illegal actions or any stoppages or anything like that, we would not, we would not win. Um, under the Railway Labor Act, <coughs> it was um, pretty clear, you know, what what we could and could not do. The Railway Labor Act also, it just kind of kept an open-ended contract. It's not like the NLRB where you know. The contract's no. over and it's done. It just goes on and on and on until they release you. So we never knew when we would be released. Mm -hmm. But it was just that constant gloom and doom going in and people realizing, you know, where, where are we headed? So, um, I mean, my biggest challenge that I felt was to keep people focused on, you know, as long as we're in there, in the room, in negotiations. And we got a shot at this, you know, and you know, hopefully time will time will tell, and time would will allow, you know, more uh, calmer eyes to look at it and make decisions in the best interests of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, I never believed that. I mean, I knew Lorenzo would, was ruthless. And, and that and all those horrible things that said it. But I would never believe that he would have allowed it just to go, I mean, just throw everything out, you know, with it and allow it to be totally destroyed mm -hmm. just because he didn't get his way. Mm -hmm. I, mean, mm -hmm. I always felt one day we would be back in all mm -hmm. through that, you know, whether it was going to be an Uber off or I know Charlie Bryan had some other discussions with some other financiers along the way that and had an interest in it, but um, <coughs> but to keep everybody together, even you know at work and you know, on task, mm -hmm. uh, was a big challenge for us. And uh, yeah. from the local perspective, we, we mm -hmm. concentrated a lot on that. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can just return to you know, Frank Borman, um, Colonel Borman, of course, was an astronaut, and he made some decisions about Eastern Airlines. Uh, he borrowed uh, a lot of money. And he borrowed that money at a very high interest rate. 
and he used the money he borrowed to upgrade Eastern's fleet. He bought uh, a number of Boeing 757s, uh, which were much more fuel efficient uh, than the current uh, aircraft in the Eastern fleet. I am told uh, that a combination of factors uh, impacted Eastern. Uh, number one, um, borrowing at that high interest rate and, and locking in at those rates. Number two, uh, the cost of jet fuel didn't increase, it decreased substantially. So here is uh, Frank Lorenzo uh, with Eastern locked in at high interest rates that are not as achieving the cost savings that he thought he would from greater fuel efficiency and uh, their expenses to service the debt were becoming so large that they needed greater revenue or to cut costs uh, and Borman came to the unions and sought wage concessions. Do, do you recall those episodes with, with Borman negotiating with the pilots, negotiating with the flight attendants and the machinists for wage concessions? Well, that, and, and all that, I think, is, is around that same time with the wage concessions and finding other formulas to um, cost savings that could be returned to us in forms of increases. Um, now, I think the analogy that was used many times with Borman and that, and, and it was, he would always talk like he's second person, like, well, the, it's the banks. You know, I'm here because of the banks. You know, well, if you go to the bank and, and ask for a 20% loan, they'll give you a 20% loan, you know, but they're going to own you, you know, and they're going to um, force you to to agree to certain things. And, and, and they forced, and they were really forcing his hand on that. Now, you know, whether... You know, some of those uh, business contracts that he had with, with, with buying a, a new airplane right off the flight line from Boeing or being the first to buy the A300s from Airbus, um, you know, if there, were, if there wasn't other motives in there besides that, you know, I don't know if we'll ever know. But to make all those deals and then come back to the employees and demand them to sacrifice for that, you know, that was there was a lot of contention on our part that that was happening and it kept happening again and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the first and second time they were coming back to us for concessions. But it always sounded to us, from the Frank and file, that they were more being dictated by the banks than by you know, Borman, and Borman wanted to say, well, if it was up to me, I wouldn't, but, you know, well, you're making a deal with the bank, so you can say it's the banks, but it is really you. Mm -hmm. um, at, at one you know. point, um, Charlie Bryan was quoted as saying that if you totaled up all the value of all the concessions that employees had made to Eastern Airlines, that the employees would have had enough money to buy Eastern Airlines. Uh, do, do you recall that statement and how accurate do you think it was? Well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I don't recall that, that statement, but um, I mean, the, the, the concessions, you know, really began in, in, in the 78. I mean, I remember in 74 we had the Nixon pay freeze. I mean, we were forced it within that. In fact, I was surprised that we haven't heard any of that in these last two years about, you know, how the, uh, I don't know if the, the laws have changed or what, but they had the national freeze, right? Um, and then we stood into 76, that's when we got into the bearable earnings program, the VEP, and we had another one, WIP, WIP, we had a few acronym programs, uh, which gave us stocks and others gave us um, stocks you couldn't cash until you left or you had a long illness or something. Uh, 
but the timeline in those concessions, it was probably over a good, um, and probably Charlie Bryan won his election due to um, the VEP program being negotiated under his former, uh, his predecessor. You know, because people were getting tired of, um, you know, having these kind of, they just looked like it was a shell game. United Airlines. It was funny because they they were in our local also. We had a number of airlines in our local, and, and they would report. And, you know, at the localized meeting, we would have a report from each of the representatives from the airline. And United, they would always stand up and how one. You know, he, he said, "I hate to even say anything because we hear all these horror stories. What's going on with you?" But United. You know, uh, he could report. You know, their their stock value now is worth a hundred thousand dollars for every employee. Well, you know, three years later, their stock value for every employer was worth thirty dollars. Right? You know, and unless you could cash it out when you quit, that's the only way you made money of it, and it just went right down the drain. Mm -hmm. um, so whether. How many concessions did we give, and if we could buy it? I don't know. You know, if that, right. that would be accurate. But there were concessions made by the machinists uh, uh, to lower the cost of Eastern Airlines, as there was by the pilots and the and the flight attendants. And my recollection is that uh, Colonel Borman, Frank Borman, came to. Um, all the unions a second time, another time, and he was seeking additional concessions. And the flight attendants agreed, and I believe the number was a 15 percent wage reduction, and the uh, pilots agreed. And then Charlie Bryan, speaking for the machinists, said uh, that uh, the machinists had lost confidence in the leadership of Frank Borman. And if the board of directors at Eastern Airlines wanted a 15 percent additional concession from the machinist union, it would come only after the resignation of Frank Borman. And the board of directors said that we are not going to agree to such terms uh, that we run this airline, not Charlie Bryan, and uh, we're not going to demand that Colonel Borman resign. And the response was, if the machinists failed to give the concession, they were going to sell Eastern Airlines to Frank Lorenzo. And so you had these, these two very strong-willed individuals, Frank Borman and Charlie Bryan, with Frank Lorenzo held out as the bogeyman that if we don't reach an agreement, you, the devil is going to come and run Eastern Airlines. Do you, you remember those negotiations, uh, Mike, and the, the impact it had on rank and file workers that you represented at local lots? Well, I don't 69? think we had the, that insight to that. Um, I mean, I certainly heard it after the fact, but when, when it was going on and, um, you know, it, it knew it as a standoff at that point. Um, but when the name Frank Lorenzo hit, um, it, it just seemed so far out, out, out of the realm of reality that nobody thought that was a serious threat. Mm -hmm. We didn't, you know. And when it happened, it was it was just shock at that point that it, it could happen. Was that Lorenzo had acquired Continental Airlines and had taken that company into bankruptcy, and used the bankruptcy laws to negate uh, the collective bargaining agreements and all the wage schedules contained therein, and it was seen as uh, an abuse of the bankruptcy laws. It was seen as undermining the collective bargaining process. And no one believed uh, that uh, such tactics 
would be used uh, at Eastern Airlines, such a well-established company where there had been this record of labor management cooperation and progress and, and being built to be the largest airline in the free mm -hmm. world. Yeah, and, and I mean, and I think part of the shock was that we didn't believe also that the, that the government would stand by and, and certify such a transaction as that. Mm -hmm. You know, but then as time showed over time, there was such a, a uh, revolving door between Lorenzo's empire and the transportation department and, and that of, of, the, of the same personalities that are showing up saying, well, this thing was much bigger than, than we even imagined, you know, from a rank and file perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and so the um, negotiations um, broke down. There were no, uh, there, there was a point at which the uh, National Mediation Board uh, released the parties to engage in economic activities to withdraw their services, and, and can you give us a little insight as to um, some of that background and what was happening at that point? Let me get my, uh, this is when we were released under Lorenzo. Yes. Do you want to play over? Okay. Oh. Uh, All right, very well. So, Mike, uh, you had told us that uh, a contract had been negotiated and ratified in 1983, and then it was set to expire. The uh, amendable date would be in 1986, and then that was the year uh, that uh, Frank Lorenzo uh, purchased Eastern Airlines. And can you tell us um, what that was like? for rank-and-file workers and you as a union official to now know that Frank Lorenzo, uh, the man who took Continental into bankruptcy and negated the labor contracts, what was the reaction when word came down that Frank Lorenzo was now running Eastern Airlines? Well, the initial reaction was one of unbelief, but he he was really an unknown to us. So you know, we didn't really have a lot of knowledge of him, um, except what he had done with Texas Air. And, uh, and I remember the night that um, the announcement was made, and people would come to me, and I said, "Oh well, that that just didn't sound like that." So you always hear rumors. That always rumors always float, and so that sounds like a, a rumor. But I'll look into it, and when we started looking into it, we started seeing, well, no, this is, this is for real, and and his track history doesn't look pretty. Uh, but we have to wait and see what you know what's going to transpire here, and um, eventually we started seeing, we started seeing um, the um, the movement of assets from Eastern. To, to Continental, uh, the routes, the closing of certain stations, the transferring of gates. And we started really observing over the next year and a half the, the systematic uh, dismantling of Eastern, of seeing a lot of the valued products that Eastern had and resources that they had being shifted. Um, under this entity they call now Texas Air Holdings. Um, our reservation system was the one of the biggest uh, slaps that, that a lot of the Eastern employees felt because it was a hundred million dollar system. Um, they sold it for ten million dollars and they, and they leased it back at ten million dollars a month to Eastern to use. And just a simple math of it said, well, wait, <laughs> why doesn't people see what's going on here? You know, what, this is, this is, uh, you know, people, what do you say? Well, people used to be put in jail for doing stuff like that. 
you know, but apparently everything, it being uh, a decision made by the Texas Air Corporation of how they want to utilize their subsidiaries, made it a uh, legal transaction as far as that Lorenzo was concerned. Mm -hmm. But as we saw it, and as not only as union members, but employees of Eastern Solid, um, it was resources and it was a, a, an industry that was built by the, the uh, employees just as much as it was uh, the investors had, had invested into it. Um, and, and seeing that, <coughs> and seeing the way that um, Frank Lorenzo was treating um, all of Eastern Airlines, um, and I used to say that, I, I said it many times, he was probably the best uh, union organizer we had. Because um, he realized, and he made people realize, that unless um, we were in this together, we didn't have a chance at all, at all. Um, and that's how we approached it in, you know, moving forward of supporting our negotiating committee who has been put in place. Um, they were going through, through uh, the process of, of meeting um, as uh, they brought in the National Mediation Board. Um, I think there's many times that um, a union would call to be released um, somewhat early in negotiations. That didn't, that wasn't place. That wasn't the, what um, the strategy of our negotiators was. They were they were realizing we weren't prepared at this point. We had to see this thing unfold before we could ask for that release. Um, in fact, the company was really was too anxious to to want to be released, which was in itself gave us pause. Um, but while all this was going on, there was other aspects that we felt. And our, even our, our skilled mechanics were starting to be concerned about um, some of the way the air, airplanes were being signed off and allowed to fly um, in ways of um, they weren't allowed before to be properly uh, maintained. Um, they allowed certain things to continue to fly that, that under older days they would have been grounded until they were fixed. Um, we put together uh, a couple committees, one local in Atlanta and also Miami of a FAA safety oversight committee made up the rank and file that was um, compiling the data um, to bring to the FAA to, to let them know that this isn't just um, crying wolf. These are some, some serious uh, concerns that the mechanics have. Um, the FAA did get involved in, in that. They ended up um, fining um, Eastern during that time over a, a nine point something million dollar fine, uh, which was at the time was the highest fine ever uh, levied on uh, an airline uh, because of their shoddy maintenance practices. Uh, so these are the kind of things that, that we felt that um, you know, the, the public needs to know about, they, they should be aware of it, um, that somebody that comes in and, and just you know, wants to extract the, um, the valuable assets out of an airline and, and let it go and um, there's a price that's going to be paid. You know, you know, we worry about our safety as much as the passenger safety. Our families fly on these airlines. And then, that you know, we don't want to sign off as uh, sign off airplanes that um, shouldn't be. But people were literally getting uh, disciplined for not agreeing to sign off uh, aircraft that, that they felt wasn't serviceable. So um, these types of um, problems were just raising themselves all throughout the system and. Um, and we felt that we had to, um, you know, keep our our people intact, um, and, and 
keep us focused on what what our outcome wanted to be. And our outcome wanted to be to have you know an Eastern airline, a profitable Eastern Airlines, back and running and with you know good secured jobs. Um, <coughs> when Frank Lorenzo came in, and when the first contract hit the hit the presses, and what his offer was 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 essentially ripped our contract in two. Um, the wages were cut in half, the benefits were cut in half, um, and it was really as as hard as he came at at us. Um, it even gave it even gave our weakest members, the ones that you know that that may have bought onto a contract that that may have that was didn't you know reach a certain level. Um, but it was a wake-up call for everybody that you know he's not going to be satisfied until he, he takes it down, you know, to the to the least common denominator for everybody. So that put a lot of unity in into um, to our our membership. Well, here we have the combination of reducing uh, assets that produce revenue, uh, like the reservation system, and uh, was the Eastern Shuttle with, between Boston, New York, and Washington uh, traditionally one of the most uh, valuable routes uh, in the Eastern Seaboard? Uh, uh, w was that uh, de-emphasized or shifted as well? I would say. I mean, they, they, we considered that the crown jewel of Eastern. I mean, that was it was nothing but a money maker. You know, you could see certain routes that you know were struggling in that, but when you look at um, those assets that. That, that were being removed were, were the ones that, that gave Eastern um, the value that it had. Um, I mean, Cleveland, uh, how many gates they gave up in Cleveland for um, for Continental for virtually nothing. Um, so when you look around and you see it, <clears throat> and it was, oh, it looks like he's, he either wants to just Put Eastern all the way out of business and just shift everything into Continental after he takes off the the, the, the icing off the cake and whatever they have left, they have left, and that's the way it looks, it's going to be. But there didn't seem to be any long-term plan for a, a strong, survival, viable Eastern in what he was doing to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that pattern continued with. Um the Northeast Shuttle, and then, of course, the other great route was uh, uh, Boston and New York to Miami. And uh, Eastern had played a, such a key role uh, in that route. And did you see a, a, a similar effort at uh, losing gates in Miami, losing gates uh, at LaGuardia or at Kennedy? Well, I guess LaGuardia would have been the main uh, route between New York and Miami. Yeah. No, yeah. and at the time, I think some of the other airlines started, you know, seeing the the uh, the blood, you know, in, in American, you know, at the same time they started ramping up down in Miami, you know, they saw an injured Eastern, mm -hmm. you know, so you know from a business standpoint they were going to take advantage of of a weakened Eastern, mm -hmm. um, and you know as time goes on, you know there really was not an effort. Um, on the part of management's part to try to, you know, regroup and, and come up with another strategy to rebuild. It was just taking this, you know, to wherever it was going to end up anyway, mm -hmm. you know, down. Um, I don't know at what point where um, you know, if uh, when Marty Chagru finally took it over after the court, you know, forced Lorenzo out. You know, if it was, uh, you know, if it was too late at that point, or was it a year before that, where, you know, it, no matter what happened, it couldn't have been uh, revived. But uh, by the time it went through 18 months of bankruptcy, you know, there was just there was nothing left except the you know, skeleton to it. But all through it, I mean, our people, it was, uh, uh, 
by and large, we stayed optimistic, you know, hoping that, you know, um, better minds will solve this thing at the end, you know, and come, come to senses, but uh, uh, it didn't happen. Right, right, right. I mean, in, in your opinion, then, uh, would the, it be a fair statement that uh, assets, resources, and, and wealth uh, that was held by Eastern Airlines all were um, transferred uh, to Continental as a result of decisions by Texas Air, and that the, the, the value of those assets all became part of, of Continental, and, and essentially Eastern was bought to pick off its uh, valuable parts. That's at the, at the end afterwards. That's what it exactly looked like, you know, and, uh, you know starting with the, the reservation system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the amount of debt, you know, the amount of debt that they had, you know, they didn't have, you know, the assets to even to support that debt any longer. You know, I mean, if they were struggling before that, and they extracted all these most valuable assets, that debt, you know, there was no way to be able to put it there, and, um, mm -hmm. enough to put make the bankers happy. Right. Yeah, and then. The, the lowering of wages, the proposal to lower wages and benefits by 50 percent, uh, was that viewed as a systematic uh, diminishing of the value of work and workers? Yes. Yeah. When, uh, now, <clears throat> they, um, I think they felt that, um, and they looked at, um, and it, it's probably pretty prevalent now in today's environment, airline environment, of uh, how much work that they can contract out and how much of a savings that they can realize from that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a some of the laws back then uh, required that uh, maintenance work, for instance, needs to be done in this country. You know, those laws have been since loosened. You know, a good 40 percent of the maintenance work on U.S. aircraft are done, you know, across the borders, you know, down in uh, Singapore, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico. Um, and the way the, the, the law is, it, it takes one AMP licensed mechanic to sign off the work. You can have ten non-licensed mechanics working it, but only one to sign it off. So I think the industry saw that as a way to really reduce their bottom line when it came to maintenance. They also saw the value of what um, a worker that will load airplanes, a work at ticket counters, what a value of being able to fly their selves and their family for free. What kind of trade off with that? What kind of value is that? You know, would a w worker be willing to come in there for half the cost of what a ramp service was making if they could just fly for free? And they found out, yes. You know. There's a high, there's a high value put to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were finding that people, there's people that would work for free, they could fly for free, mm -hmm. certain jobs. Yeah. So um, now, you know, our members, you know, they, they built the industry to where it ended up at, you know, and. Uh, you know, to just be dismissed as that is just, uh, you know, well, we can just, you know, charge to the bottom of the pay pool and replace you, you know, by putting these other incentives in there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was, it was an insult to them and uh, something that they, you know, wanted to protect. 
Were there any efforts by the board of directors at Eastern Airlines to protect the assets, to protect the viability of the corporation and the value of its stock from these efforts uh, by Frank Lorenzo to bleed off assets? You know, I, I don't know if, if they had the, um, I mean, I, I would answer first, I don't know, you know, I, I just don't know what kind of conversation took place there, but I don't know if any of them had um, much of a, a, a say into it, just by the base of how much Texas Air holding company held of all, all the, the value of the stocks. I think by and large they were the best owner of, of it all. You know. And uh, I think that would be an interesting project to try to include in the, here. You know, what kind of conversations did they have? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, the contract became amendable in 1986, and uh, the, the proposals. Uh, were to uh, slash uh, wages and benefits, and um, my understanding is that uh, employees uh, rejected uh, those proposals out of hand, that they weren't uh, the industry standard, uh, that they had no basis in, in reality or the going wage rates for those positions represented by the IAM. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the dynamics of, of some of that, uh, of those proposals and employees' reactions? Well, we have, um, under our Constitution, we have um, we had to bring that back to the to the employees, to the members, um, to vote. And you have to, you have to have two votes. You have a strike vote and a vote uh, to accept or reject the contract. And we tell them when they do that, if you if you don't vote to strike, you don't vote for the contract, you voted for the contract. <laughs> and you have to, it takes 66 percent under our Constitution to be able to to, to strike. Mm -hmm. um, we held our, um, uh, we held our strike vote, it would be, well, we, once we were released we would schedule the strike vote, so it would be three weeks before the about three weeks before the, the actual date. And it was a uh, like a 93% plus on both of them, strike and reject a contract. You know, so it was, um, and we had all day informational meetings, the negotiating committee came in, explained each uh, of the changes point by point. Um, you know, what it would cost, you know, what the cost of the additional costs on insurance and reduction of the, of the pay and uh, set up a, a two levels of, of pay scale. So it was just, um, you know, thrown out, just uh, just rejected over overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. You know, people said, you know, well, I'm not going to work for that, period. Right. Yeah. Now, when we went out, we had here, um, Every, we had 100% walk out. Um, we had about seven of them that we identified over the next month or so that went back in, but that was about it. Uh, so seven uh, who crossed the picket line and went back in, Right. Uh, out of how many employees? Well, out here in Atlanta it was 3,200 at the time. Some might call that solidarity. I would call that yeah, super solidarity. And um, that was um, leading up to it. I'll, I'll tell you, we, it was uh, probably one of the most interesting parts of my whole career of uh, preparing for that. You know, because uh, we had our red side and our green side, right? And we were always there, but. Um, I called a red side, green side meeting, you know, to put out a, issue a statement of solidarity, you know, going forward, you know, and this was, um, as we were new, it, I guess it was towards that, 
towards the end, before he went on strike, you know, that you know we're all in this together, and we got to move forward, and um, and you know, though um, we name it would not be the person I would want to work with. We all we all have to do, and we have to show that here for everybody, and we did. <coughs> we took full advantage of having a city council here that understood rights, basic rights, so, uh, civil rights. So when we applied for our picketing uh, permit, we identified every cranny and corner of the airport that we could think of, of where we should have a picket which included inside the concourses, at the top of each escalator at B and C, top of each escalator there, um, outside of every door coming into the eastern, um, every gate surrounding it. We even got a permit to have the field across from adjacent to the hangar, and we needed that because our local was in Forestville and we said, you know, we're going to be transferring, transporting pickets back and forth the air, airport all day and night, you know, and we just need a more of a centralized place to be able to congregate and, and move them around. They gave us everything we wanted, and um, that was, I guess that was... Uh, Mayor um, Maynard Jackson, I guess it was his administration, um, which we ended up you know, building a tent city effect. Did you, were you familiar with that over there? A tent city that we had over there? Mm -hmm. And, you know, right on that land. Um, and it just drove Eastern just absolutely nuts. You know, because it was it was man day day in and day out, and we ended up having you know bands come out there and family days, and hot dogs, and just kind of grew. Um, and um, but having that, and then being able to um, you know keep the people a place to keep them centralized, keep them informed, and that was. Um, you know, very helpful for the initial strength of, of, of the picket line. Um, Can I ask about the role of the U.S. government, the role of the National Mediation Board in terms of uh, keeping the parties together, uh, actively participating in mediation efforts, and then um, other tools that were available under the Railway Labor Act, in, including uh, a presidential emergency board. Um, how did any of those things uh, play into the negotiation with Eastern and the machinists? Um. I don't know if I can answer that question. I, I think. Um, well, let me be more specific. Did the did the president appoint a, a presidential emergency board to hold hearings and issue a report on the negotiations between Eastern? No, uh, no, that was rejected. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so we uh, we we recently had. Uh, uh, several presidential emergency boards uh, appointed uh, to hold hearings and to uh, release a fact-finding report, uh, and uh, numerous times those have resulted in agreements before the terms and conditions are voted on by the Congress. Uh, and yet in, in this situation, uh, there was not even a presidential emergency board appointed. No, and that was the vote that that they 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 kept the Congress kept from allowing to happen. That was the, they prevented that, mm -hmm. and that's what we were attempting to have put in place. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. But that's where we found that, you know, that revolving door between Congress, between the Department of Transportation and Texas Air and Bush, and, you know, it was a pretty tight circle of people that, that controlled that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and even though, I mean, it would, it would, I mean, even binding arbitration is, you know, the last thing that we, you know, would want. You know, but you, you get in a circumstance, you have to, you have to. You know, but that was, um, you know, it's one of the circumstances. Well, you know, we, we would, whatever it takes, you know, let's get other people in there. But that that's not, uh, that was fought tooth and nail by Texas Air and, and Lorenzo mm -hmm. to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1989? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so President uh, George Herbert Walker Bush would have been president right. and he of course made his home in Houston, Texas yeah. at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we, is it a fair statement that uh, from the machinist perspective uh, that the provisions of the Railway Labor Act including mandatory mediation of, of uh, holding the parties and not releasing them uh, and uh, pointing appointment of a presidential emergency board that none of those things were done and that it allowed uh, the employer, um, Eastern Airlines, uh, Texas Air as the holding company uh, to engage in economic activity uh, that was not going to result in a collective bargaining agreement. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so does that, does that speak to the importance of uh, the labor movement uh, being involved in political <laughs> activities that then result in public policy? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, it, it, was, it was a great civic lesson for our members, too, because during this time also, Newt Gingrich was running for Congress. And he about lost. He, he came within 800 and some votes of losing. And, and a lot of that was. Our, our our people, well, they weren't working, so they got got a lot of political activists out of folks that normally wouldn't get involved in it. But they also saw that you know where he could have influenced it prior prior to the strike, you know he could have used his office to influence some of what was going on. Uh, he chose not to, you know, and um, and people realized that. You know and how important it is. You know, uh, and I always think about boy, what history would have been changed if uh, if we had got that 800 votes there. Mm -hmm. And his challenger was uh, an attorney by the name of Dave. David Worley. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what was uh, what was heartbreaking about that? In fact, I mean, he was so close; they were. You know, there were some people even calling him, calling, calling the election early for Dave. And we were over at the hotel over there, but uh, but his, his uh, Dave had gone to the the uh, National Democratic, I guess, Congressional Committee or whatever, and asked. For additional fifty thousand dollars, that last leading up to the last two weeks for radio to really, so he felt that would be enough. And they said, nah, "It's you're not close enough." <laughs> and then, I mean, the day after the election, they must have spent a million sending, you know, planes full of lawyers down for a recount and see if there was anything that they could do on, you know, upturning that election. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm. Yeah, yeah, yes. History can be changed by just a few, a few hundred votes, one way or another. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And that was contract for America. After that, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Nineteen ninety-four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the uh, vote was ninety-three uh, percent to go on strike. Uh, the vote was ninety-three percent to reject the contract. Uh, and so uh, failure by the the government to intercede to take any action uh, to ensure a continuation of service uh, by the airline. And uh, the NMB then invoked a cooling off period, is that correct? 
30 day cooling off mm -hmm. and then, um, until midnight of the third. And the, the date that you were, but both parties were released or the uh, end of the cooling off period, that was March 3rd, 3rd, 3rd 1989. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, what events were then put into place as of uh, March 3rd, 1989? Uh, once that happened, uh, once that happened was to start, uh, well, everybody had fair warning on where their picket assignments would be, where they're expected to show up. We had to um, you know, get the set it up to be able to feed the picketers and have them poured in certain areas and transporting them and where to park. And, uh, so um, we just took care of the you know the business here. Um, reached out to the local um, other local unions, Atlanta Labor Council, State Fed, you know, Richard Ray. Um, Who's the state fed? Herb, Herb Mabry, mm -hmm. building trades. So they came and um, yeah, everybody just rolled up their sleeves. The, the land and labor community was there. I remember the building trades bringing. So we we had the permit of that field, which was just all mud. <laughs> the building trades came with you know, truckloads of big big rock. You know, set down a foundation there for us. Um, helped build a stage there. You know, put tents where we could cook under. Um, different locals started, uh, you know, we'd be contacting us, asking, you know, what do we need? And if there was any jobs that were available, the IOTC folks, they had contracts at the convention center for these uh, uh, big trade shows and that. And they said, you know, we we're always looking for people. If you, we run out of our list, if your people want to sign up, we'll <coughs> put them on the list. They'll be able to come in and, and you know work. So there was just a lot of uh, you know local local support you know from the labor community around churches, even some of the restaurants along Virginia Avenue. They were bringing over you know buckets of iced tea and stuff. You know. So um, you know, I felt it was you know starting it off. It looked like well you know the community's with us you know and. Uh, when the people see that inside those fences, you know, they're going to realize, you know, um, let's get this thing resolved. You know. and that was always a hopeful thing at that point. We were we really help, hoped that it would, you know, come to a conclusion, as most strikes do. Mm. You know. mm -hmm. Right. Mm. <laughs> Uh, Ninety-eight percent of negotiations uh, result in a contract, so a strike is a, a rare thing. Uh -huh. uh, and then uh, the majority of those end up with uh, negotiations uh, reconvening. And were, what were the reaction uh, after the display of community support and solidarity from other labor unions? Uh, were there any, was there any movement? Uh, on behalf of the company to uh, recommence uh, negotiations. No, they, um, you know, they shut they shut down the operation, and um, they p started putting together their startup plan, and um, they kept you know the the public aware of their you know their startup plan, and uh, I think they were going to launch it. In early um, April, you know, when the the flight attendants and the pilots walked out, and um, so they had a they had a regroup after that also. But you know, they were going to inaugurate a new startup plan. I think it was April seventh or so, and um, start flying limited routes. So their concentration was pretty much all on that. Um, now, our president, uh, you know, Charlie Bryant, um, he was still, uh, you know, looking for that white knight, uh, looking for that buyer. There was a number of interested parties, um, and if he thought, you know, that there was an opportunity to bring somebody in that wants to run it, you know, we would be uh, willing to sit down and, and work with them. You know, a few people came and went, and 
some of them, they were on ongoing discussions. Basically, that's the most information we were getting from that that we could report to to our membership. <clears throat> a few times, Charlie, we'd come into town and we set up a, you know, and advertise it that you know he'll be here on Saturday or whatever, and um, kind of give us a report then so people would hear it themselves. Um, you know, any 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 type of information that we would get, any movement at all, you know, we would first thing we would do would get that communicated to to our folks, whether it's through handouts or or what, we'd get it out. And then, as those questions came up, well, did the uh, Eastern Airlines ever launch the, the the restart the new Eastern Airlines? Yeah, <coughs> yeah, they did. Um, but it just dug our heels in that much tighter. I mean, it was um, you know, the the people had to go through two or three pickets you know, anytime they get in the airplane in the airport here in Atlanta, especially. Um, we gave a, an exemption one time for um, for the mayor because the the national the international Olympic committee they were reviewing all the different <laughs> all the different cities that they were planning on you know that were going for the Olympic I guess the seventy ninety six Olympics. Mm -hmm. right. They hadn't, they hadn't yet chosen it, you know. So they were trying to showcase the best of the land, and they needed to. And it just so happened it coincided with Jesse Jackson coming down, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were having a prayer session in front of the Eastern ticket counter, and, and uh, he marched just over there, and then he said, "Everybody kneel, everybody knelt." And, and <laughs> And the Olympic Committee came through, and they were, you know, I don't know, maybe the prayers got us to the Olympics there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so take us through that uh, timeline, then. Um, Eastern launches, and people have to walk through picket lines, that. How long did they continue to operate before um, Eastern Airlines shut down? Well, they, <clears throat> they shut down um, at the end of... I guess it was in January of ninety one. Was the final shutdown. It was bleeding. Everybody knew. I mean, there was just. Um, I don't think it was any shock when it ended up shutting down. It was more shock that they were even able to start up and get that, but they just couldn't get any traction. There was. Um, the um, you know their plans, their um, uh, putting together a viable plan to get out of bankruptcy, uh, kept on being delayed and delayed. Uh, I'm not sure of the timeline, but at one point, you know, Lorenzo was removed, and then Marty Chagru was put in there to, I guess, as a trustee you know, for the uh, for that, but. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that they just weren't able to um, to get beyond, you know, the strike. That was that was. Um, they, they certainly couldn't do it if they weren't going to sit down with any of the unions and do it. And so they, that was their final decision that they made. We would either sit it down and see if we can work out a. Agreement or just shut it down altogether. It was too late. So I think between um, probably their board and the banks, you know, it, it was we couldn't we couldn't salvage. It. Mm -hmm. So what do you think um, in terms of the uh, precipitating events? Uh, was it uh, more the bleeding off of assets of Eastern? to uh, Texas Air as a holding company uh, that then rendered Eastern almost incapable of operating a, a successful, profitable airlines? Um, or, you know, some people have continually tried to blame uh, the unions, that if they had only had agreed to 
cut their wages. If they'd only had agreed to something, then Eastern Airlines could have been salvaged. Uh, what is your, your thoughts on those opinions, Mike? Oh, um, I don't think that, um, I, I believe that, that Frank Lorenzo um, intention was to be able to operate his company without unions on the property. And that if he had taken the drastic steps that he had taken would be enough for the unions just to throw in the white towel and that would be it. And he would be left alone and could do whatever he wanted. I don't think he imagined that the fight that that he faced um, was going to be part of it, but I don't think his ego allowed him to, to walk away from it either. Uh, I don't believe at all that he, for one minute, ever wanted to work with us and to allow unions to, to be viable <coughs> on his property, no matter how much or how little he paid. He didn't want to have to deal with the unions at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was kind of his track record. They didn't. You know, now, funny thing. I mean, now they have. You know, some, Continental's pretty successful these days. You know, they have some good union contracts on. On the care. But um, I think he thought he he just got too greedy. He thought he could get everything that he wanted, and um, he could come in with such a heavy hammer, and he just could destroy us, and, um, and just move on. So, uh, I was at the um, hearing where he tried to, you know, he was he was ruled incompetent by the FAA uh, t two years later. To he wanted to start another airline. You know, did you know about that? Yeah. And uh, so they had a hearing up at. Um, so this was under the Clinton administration now. So he had a hearing at the FAA and an administrative law judge. So it was our attorneys and the Alpha's attorneys and TWU's attorneys that presented the case why he's, you know, you know he should not be authorized to operate an airline. He's incompetent. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was it was how he operated through his tenure at, at uh, Eastern Airlines. Right. Right. And yeah. the judge ruled against him. He said, yeah, he, mm -hmm. he should never have be able to run another airline in this country. Uh, he had been uh, the head of Eastern at the time that the FAA imposed at that time the largest fine in the history of the airline industry for some of the uh, substandard safety practices that he had directed employees to engage in. Pencil with. Yeah. <laughs> right. So now as we talk about the airline industry from a, a broader perspective, and, and Lorenzo said he didn't want to operate uh, with unions, uh, yet we have examples in the airline industry where some of the most heavily unionized carriers are some of the most successful. And of course I'm speaking about Southwest Airlines. Uh, but has the uh, and recent you know, uh, startup uh, discount carrier AirTran Airways has uh, seven collective bargaining agreements, so they're those two are, you know, in the process of merging. Southwest has bought out AirTran, but they are very heavily unionized. Uh, so, from your perspective, is the determinant of profitability and success in the airline industry the rate of unionization, or are there other factors that determine an airline success? I think there are certainly other factors. Um, I think one of the benefit of, of unionizing, and, and for <clears throat> not only for airlines, but for, I think for all industry. You know, when, when you're paying a good livable wage and your benefits, um, people have an, in, have, have an interest to stay at those jobs. And 
as you stay at a job longer and you have that experience longer, it just inherently gives a better product and delivers a better product for whatever industry you're in. Um, I see, I mean, even, even on safety, even from viewing things from a safety standpoint, sometimes it's, it's scary in my job today, I go out and I see all these, uh, across every sector of our economy pretty much and see. And a lot of what the airlines have done and the way they converted those jobs to, you go out here and uh, Hartfield and you see you know, all the north, uh, north cargo buildings all the way down. Well, it, it's one big rotating door, you know, where people come in and they'll work for a month or two months or three months and then they're out, you know. Well, yeah, they can load an airplane, you know, but can they load it, you know, properly? You know, do they, do they have that consciousness of safety that somebody that puts their family on there every day? Um, you know, are they going to you know, provide those kind of services that, um, you know, they have a, an investment in, you know, to making sure it's done right. You know, but having, you know, just workers that, well, if you don't want to do it, you know, there's a line mile long waiting to step in here and take in your job. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of country we want to get into. You know, more and more, that's, some of these jobs are turning into that. Mm -hmm. um, I think you um, you mentioned <coughs> um, Southwest. I mean, Southwest. I mean, their their whole model is different than than most of the industry out there. But a very successful model. It's, it's really people driven. You know, it's driven. You know, by the by, uh, mainly by the workers, you know, well, the ticket counters and the flight crews and the and baggage handlers. They can turn these airplanes around in 20 minutes, you know, fill them up and move them on and people are happy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, people do make that one work. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the competition is based on uh, the skills of the workers, uh, their dedication to their job, and the craftsmanship that they bring to producing a product and level of service that consumers are pleased by and willing to pay for. Um, if I could just ask you about some of the things that you saw and experienced as uh, a leader of that local lodge in Atlanta during the, the strike uh, against Eastern Airlines as far as what people experienced to, Initially, there was some euphoria of uh, the community support and other union support and uh, city government here in Atlanta. And then as time went on, um, how did people react? What, what happened to, to people in their, in their lives as a result of that strike? Well, <clears throat> I think one of the first things I recognized as time started moving and the months started adding up, is the, the members that had the skills jobs. Um, were the ones that found the easiest to be able to find other jobs. Mm -hmm. Huge. Probably 90% without a problem finding them. I mean, not necessarily turn wrenches on an airplane, <coughs> but they had enough skills to be able to do convert into other industry, um, which is different than our, our ramp, you know, they, they ended, a lot of them ended up service jobs, and most of them ended up jobs paying a lot less than what they were making um, at Eastern. Um, I mean, I remember even going through and having a number of discussions about, you know, the importance of when we get back to work, you know, using that as maybe um, as a motivator to bring more skills to our people that are that are in the workplace. There, you know, whether it's apprenticeship or or what, you know, pull more from the inside. Um, 
I think from the um, family standpoint, um, you realize it's it, it's the entire family that's impacted, you know, by that. And um, um, those types of you know domestic issues and stuff start rising to the top of the ones then. If they're already having problems, it just increases it that much quicker. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there were there were a, a few there were a, a few suicides and that, and I never. Uh, I mean, it, I could never say, well, that that's why they committed suicide, and I would never say that. I mean, you just never know. It's such a complicated sure. event of why somebody does something like that. You know. But it certainly could contribute to it, you know. But to use it as that, I, I was always hesitant of saying that's why somebody did that. Um, I think um, there was enough social nets around where you know people didn't end up out on the street, you know, where they had family and stuff. They might have moved into an apartment or something like that, but. After about, I would say after the first nine months or so, people started coming to terms and saying they got to move on somehow or another. And, um, you know, hopefully this will, they still showed up for the picket duty and that, but they had to move on with their life. You know, and they, they uh, by and large, most of them, you know, did. You know, there was a few that were, I remember I, I got a call, I, I must have been up in D.C. for five years and somebody called well, you know, what's going on type of thing. Like, you know, I heard, saw a blip in the paper, and it's like, you know, felt kind of sorry. You know, didn't anybody tell you? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of the airlines um, hired our mechanics, uh, U.S. Air, Northwest. Delta wouldn't hire one. Mm -hmm. That was uh, interesting for our people to see that. And, I mean, Delta and Delta was hiring at the time. We have some of the best mechanics in the country because a lot of them within that age group had gone through a, um, an apprenticeship program that, that they used to have in Miami. <coughs> and even a lot of our supervisors and foremen, you know, were graduates for that. So, um, you know, when it came to, you know, top-notch mechanics, you know, Delta had to pick, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't, anybody that had a union card in their pocket for sure, you know. Um, saw how many people, and this was somewhat of a, an awakening of how many um, people were willing to, to cross our picket line, and um, from all over the country. I mean, our, our hangar parking lot used to fill up with Tags. I mean, I remember seeing tags from Hawaii, you know, and um, coming in and paying them. I mean, they were they were paying them half what they what we were getting paid. You know, crossing the picket line, it didn't work. That was somewhat of a weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the. Um, The city it started getting worn out, you know, with its good feeling towards us and support of that. You know, there was a lot of pressure coming in, you know, from, from other industry and that. I guess you know, when then we ended up up in the you know bankruptcy court. Um, in fact, the bankruptcy court took away our rights to pick it. Where we remember I told you about the. Sure. The application. Well, they mm -hmm. took it away, mm -hmm. and um, we appealed it. And the week after Eastern shut down for good, the appellate court ruled in our favor that the bankruptcy court did not have jurisdiction, you know, to to step in on um, on uh, picketing yeah. rights, you know, which is a good which was a good win. For labor, you know, right. it didn't do us a lot of good, but mm -hmm. it, for labor. But um, I think going going into it and um, 
utilizing you know the best that we could with the city and and um, you know having that having the civil rights history here and knowing that we're dealing with folks that understand you know the, um, how people want to keep you keep you down mm -hmm. uh, certainly helped us but there was a point there was a tipping point there over time sure. you know people get worn out yeah well, I think it is an extremely important precedent to set that the bankruptcy court does not have jurisdiction nor the right to extinguish people's First Amendment free speech rights. <laughs> uh, you've talked about uh, it came to a tipping point and people had to had to move on. That uh, Eastern Airlines was was not going to come to an agreement with the unions, and you know within 18 months they were out of business entirely. Uh, and, and what about uh, you, Mike Flynn, and moving on with your life uh, after Eastern Airlines, after being president of that local lodge? Uh, where did your career take you? Well, it was, um, well, see, that job at the, at the, uh, that I had, it, was, it wasn't a paid position, the president's job was not a paid position, and it was... Uh, but part of our bylaws, it gave it, it was a, a two. It was two hundred dollars a month, and I would be. Um, well, I, actually, it was it was, you know, two yeah, hundred dollars a month, and then um, I would get my uh, strike pay, which was a hundred dollars a hundred dollars a month a week. Strike pay. Um, now, towards the end, I'm in fact, I, I did a little bit of that IATSE work out at the convention. I probably worked two or three conventions, um, go in at midnight and put it up. But um, during that time, there was a bill, and I think it was in 90, the striker replacement bill that was um, trying to get through Congress. And the machinists, uh, each of the unions, um, we were assigned through the AFL-CIO, different states. Georgia was one of ours in Washington. So, so um, my uh, leadership asked if I would, you know, spearhead it in Georgia, you know, and help coordinate it, you know, in Georgia to get support, you know, with the with the coalitions that we have here and the other unions to get people, you know, make contact. So. So I worked at for about a few months, I guess four months or so, um, and then shortly after that the, um, the strike ended and um, I, I got a call from headquarters. Um, and they said there's a job up here for, um, it's under a grant in our safety and health department. Um, and we know you're, you know, originally from this area, you know, we know you'd be looking for a job, so, you know, if you're interested, you know, come up and talk to us about it. So I went up there and I, uh, I really hadn't, up until that time, I really didn't think about what I was going to do next. I mean, it just didn't, I was just kind of just all caught up in there, all of it, you know, and uh, so uh, I went up there and, um, it was a, a grant with a, it was with a consortium of four or five different unions. It was steel workers and rubber workers at the time, and uh, chemical workers. <coughs> to, um, it was funded through the Superfund and it was clean up um, protected members that, that work with hazardous chemicals, you know, and teaching them in 40 hour courses. But, um, so they brought me up there on that, and um, I started working that. And um, that was in 91, May of 91. Um, we had a number of other grants under I Am Cares at the time, which no longer exists, but um, they received a lot of grants for um, a project with industry, uh, helping people with disabilities. Um, find jobs and they had different offices throughout the country uh, 
200 employees. Um, and uh, so that was actually who I initially worked for, was under the CARES. And then my boss, who was the, my predecessor, uh, he made appointed me the, his assistant to the president in 95, and then when he retired in 96, I was uh, given the full reign of the department of us, was the safety and health department, and the apprenticeship department is, was in there, uh, the community services department was in there, and I am CARES. Well, I am CARES. Um, was a huge project that most of the I Am Cares money was from grants, um, funds. We had another program that, that that sprang out of I Am Cares, that, that sprang out of the disability end, and that was a fee-for-service program with Boeing, where uh, we had professional vocational rehab counselors that are employed by CARES at the time that would work with IAM members that get injured on the job <coughs> to find a way to get them back to work as soon as possible. And they work with uh, the union, the company, the insurance, worker comp, um, and they find an accommodation in that. Well, that entity is run by it's it's a nonprofit, separate nonprofit, 501c3, and that was I Am Cares. So when I took over this job, I became president of I Am Cares. And shortly after that, we split that Cares to just handling our safety training and the vocational rehab fee for service program for Boeing, and we call that I Am Cres. So currently. I'm the president of I Am Crest, director of safety and apprenticeship. Now, Crest, we have, I brought in a lot of other grants into Crest for worker training grants. Um, what we do, um, well, we have 22 vocational rehab counselors. These are all master's degree rehab counselors that are employees of Crest that work, most of them work at uh, the Puget Sound in Washington. We have two or three in Wichita, one in Portland, Oregon, and then we have two with Spirit Aerospace, which is a company that, that Boeing sold. So we have that group of employees. Uh, I found working with grants that um, the good thing for the union in working with these grants is that under IRS rules that we can use the money, any profits that we make, as, as long as we deliver the same services with those profits. So if we're teaching people how to protect themselves with hazmat, and any money that we generate from that, we can take it to a local or a district and offset the cost of staff to pay to train them. So during the days where, where you know, times that money's tight, it's a funding source to be able to provide safety training to members that normally would not receive certain training. You know, or they work for a company that won't invest the training, but they need it. So um, now we have. Um, we have the, the Boeing Return to Work program, um, the Spirit Return to Work. We have a grant with the Department of Transportation to train airline workers that handle hazardous materials, loading and unloading um, aircraft, uh, and the proper way of doing that. And that's, um, and mainly we're training, our, our grant is to train our members to train the rest of the member, the rest of the workers. So it's like a train to trainer thing. So we're at United Airlines, Alaska Airlines, we were at Northwest, um, US Air, Hawaiian. Um, 
we still have our consortium with the chemical workers that train our members that work around hazardous materials. Proper emergency response to that. I have a grant with the uh, Black Car Compensation Fund in New York City that that, that we train um, limo drivers in New York City. Um, the National Safety Council Defensive Driving Course. It's a six-hour course, plus we add a two-hour stress dealing with stress course on top of that. Um, and then um, the staff, I have four full-time staff at headquarters that are instructors and they develop curriculum and they do training. Um, they either do it, we either do it pro bono for our or districts or locals that need it or if companies um, want to pay for it, we have a fee for service structure that goes through Crest. It can't go through the union funds, so it stays through this nonprofit entity. So it's a, just a lot of different activity. I, I'm kind of the administrator of all this, so it's kind of juggling a bunch of different balls, which I like to do. But um, the best part of it is a lot of, of the training that we provide and I know, I mean, through all my time at Eastern, I can remember maybe one hour of, of working with chemi of, of hazardous materials handling. Now, you know, they had this uh, value jet, you know, that, that took a dive into the, into the um, Everglades. And it was all about, you know, mechanics putting on a box of oxygen, um, Canisters. Canisters that were in the you know, wrong area, they were ignited. Um, but you know, we we have members where we have them in every industry. You know, de you know, making missiles, you know, aircraft, making ships, railroads, manufacturing, um, uh, sugar. Uh, we they're just everywhere, and we're working around some horrendous materials and chemicals and that and and what 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 this really gives us an opportunity to do and I'm proud to be able to be the one to be able to to make it happen is um, getting that kind of training to people that just wouldn't have never gotten it mm -hmm. and, you know the unions they, they have so much money I mean you know, they get their dues and their their main function is to service negotiate and arbitrate you know, now, this is really kind of extra above and beyond that if we have the ability to, um, you know, to do, identify these funds that are out there anyhow. Um, and this, the, the funds that I was um, hired under, they just, this is their 20th year with the chemical workers. They have a, they have a their training center is in, in Cincinnati. 20th year that they've been pulling down from these funds, putting these programs on all over the country. Mm -hmm. Thousands, I mean, I, thousands and tens of thousands of our members have gone, have been recipients of some kind of a training related to these grant funds. Mm -hmm. you know. well, it's, that is uh, quite a, a record uh, of accomplishment in providing that level of training. The, the labor movement provides uh, more training hours than uh, any other entity beyond uh, uh, formal education, either at uh, elementary, secondary, or post-secondary, and uh, the United States military. Uh, and so it is uh, ranked pretty high in terms of the number of hours of instruction per year outside of formal education institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, Mike Flynn, uh, what lessons uh, do you take away from uh, your uh, career with the labor movement and in particular your involvement uh, with the machinists uh, and um, with uh, the Eastern Airlines negotiations and strike. Well, the one, one lesson I have is if, if I try to 
planned this out when I was 18 years old and what direction my life was going to take me, it would have been impossible to do that. Um, I think it, it's the war <clears throat> with labor management is just ongoing. It, it'll always be there. Um, I always look for people within our movement um, that are in it uh, for the right reasons, that are in it not, you know, for their own ego or for their, um, certainly they won't get rich, um, but are in it to, to be able to contribute to the betterment of, of others. And the labor movement gives us that opportunity to do that. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in a union, and when I took this position, and, and um, one of the uh, first months I called my, my boss, our international president, I asked him, you know, I, I need to go see this guy, and, and he goes, Mike, you just do what you need to do. That's why I hired you. If you think it's, it's what you need to do to get the job done, and that's all you need. You don't need to. And I, I mean, I, I take that with me every day I go. I mean, that, that, to me, that's a luxury to have, a, you know, someone that has that kind of confidence in you. But um, I know from, you know, where I started and and what I've been involved in over the years and watching stuff grow, um, and it grew because. You know, not me, you know. I was part of a bigger part, but of uh, a lot of the people that you know came along the way, and I saw, you know, that that, that could contribute. Um, it's it's. Uh, I don't know how I would feel if I at the end of or at fifty six years age where I am now that, um, and I took a career path of a, of a, of a Frank Lorenzo or somebody that, that, that based, you know, my success on, you know, whether my, what my portfolio was or my bank account was, of, of what that would do for me. I would, for me personally, it may not do anything to me. For me personally, it would just be somewhat very empty. You know, but looking back and saying, you know, you never know, especially in safety and health, if it, if it made a difference. You know, you, you don't. But um, you, I, I certainly have to assume. I have to assume that, that um, you know, people's lives are better today for you know some of the work that I've done along the way, and um, you know, no, you know, I'll never win all the battles and. Certainly, Lorenzo taught me that one, you know. But um, you want to look back and say, well, at least I fought a good fight, you know, and I did it for the right reasons. You know, it wasn't just about me. Yeah, so yeah, people people get hurt and families uh, get divided and all that through it. But um, but all in all, you know, I don't think I would have. Uh, I couldn't have seen it going any other way, throwing in a towel with him, or just walking off. So I, I feel I, I feel uh, very grateful, actually, you know, just that I've been able to have a have a career that and I've contributed something. You know. So be able to say that, I feel good. Mike Flynn, we want to thank you very much on behalf of Georgia State University. We want to thank you on behalf of the Voices of Labor Oral History Project, sponsored by the Special Collections Department here at the Georgia State University Library. Uh, this interview will be reviewed and eventually posted for students and researchers here at the Southern Labor Archives. So again, our thanks for you to be willing to sit for an interview as part of the uh, Labor Center's uh, Oral History Project. Thank you.
Well, usually I would say, sir, and then we'll, I guess it goes.